This is CBC Vancouver News. That was the, the final offer. And Surrey City Council has rejected that final offer from the province to help it transition to a city police force. It means significant dollars to the city, uh, or to the taxpayer. Plus... I feel like I've been betrayed by my own people. BC's First Nations Health Authority says it will have to limit who can use some support services. We've seen our, um, our counselling services under residential schools I would say, grow dramatically over the last two years. The Premier says he'll do what he can to help. And... After last year's destruction, how are different communities in BC preparing for this wildfire season? Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. The city of Surrey has rejected what the province says is its final offer to support a transition to a municipal police force. The public safety minister says the deadline for a deal was 4 p.m. today. As Mira Baines explains, Surrey's mayor argues forcing them away from the RCMP could come with massive costs to taxpayers. Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth announced the City of Surrey has said no to its latest offer. He says the city reached out in January to negotiate a deal and resolve the long-running dispute. The province's deadline was 4 o'clock today. Mayor Brenda Locke and Surrey City Council have failed to act in the best interest of the people of Surrey. Once again, they have demonstrated they want to continue this conflict rather than working together to complete the transition and keep people safe. He said last week the mayor of Surrey wrote to him that council had agreed in principle to the financial commitment that the province is offering, but ultimately the answer was no. The province will use the $150 million to support the transition directly until it is completed. Any additional costs that end up getting passed on to the people of Surrey are the result of the failure of the mayor and council. The province says Surrey rejected an offer of $150 million over five years and an offer to pay the difference in salaries if SPS salaries were more in 2029 for another five years, up to $20 million per year. Farnworth says an agreement was even reached in principle between BC and the federal government that would ensure the RCMP can support the SPS as police of jurisdiction. He also pointed out the agreement meant there would be no reason for police-related tax increases for at least a decade. Earlier today, Surrey Mayor Brenda Locke, who campaigned on a promise of keeping the RCMP in Surrey, pointed out the cost of the transition. She announced the city's draft budget and a 7% tax hike. The fact is, the Surrey Police Service is eating into our ability to deliver new projects. However, our focus has always been Surrey residents and we will provide uh, for our citizens with the improvements and the amenities in our city that they deserve. What hangs in the balance is that both sides are due in BC Supreme Court at the end of the month. The city asked for a judicial review of the province's decision. Still, Farnworth says the transition will move ahead and he looks forward to announcing the target date of a change of command with more information coming next week. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. BC families who have lost relatives to suicide have criticized and challenged BC's Mental Health Act for years. A handful of them gathered at the legislature today to support changes to the act proposed by the opposition. As Bill Puri explains, the aim is to try to save more lives. Just over a year ago, James Zimmer was released from the mental health unit at Royal Jubilee Hospital. His family received no word about his discharge. He had always allowed me to um, show up for him and I just didn't get that opportunity. Within a few hours of release, James died by suicide. Since then, his family has been fighting for changes to the Mental Health Act. If you will be a danger of ending your own life and it's fine, there's the door. People are dying because of it and families are being left without the opportunity to support their loved ones in their most vulnerable moments. The BC United critic for mental health and addictions agrees there should be amendments to the act. A private member's bill proposes medical professionals seek additional information from family before a patient is admitted or discharged from a mental health facility. These changes will reflect the need for better communication 
with close relatives who are providing their continued care. A similar bill was introduced last year. The NDP government failed to adopt it. BC Minister of Mental Health and Addictions Jennifer Whiteside says our government takes seriously the need to balance the rights of the individual with the obligation to help and protect people living with mental illness. Oh, thank you, Father James. James Pazder suffered from schizophrenia and drug addiction. In February, he was released from a mental health facility with no information shared with his family. We should have families involved in care. We do know them best. Within a week, James died by suicide. If we had notification, if we had uh, medical staff interacting with us as a family, James might still be alive today. Mental health advocates say the rules are there, they're just not being followed. These families want that to change, so what happened to them doesn't happen to other families. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. BC's First Nations Health Authority says it will have to limit eligibility for some counselling services. But loved ones of residential school survivors are worried many will be left without care. As Michelle Morton explains, health care providers and clients say they feel betrayed. I feel like I've been betrayed by my own people is how it feels and we need to stand together and this feels like it's, it, you know, they're intentionally doing things that are ripping us apart. Felina Robinson says she's been accessing counselling through the First Nations Health Authority for the past two years and has been working through generational trauma. Her grandmother went to a residential school but now says that counselling is being ripped away from her. The First Nations Health Authority announced former residential school survivors and their families, as well as families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, will need to prove status to get certain services. The FNHA says a self-declaration method had been used, but that process became unsustainable. So uh, we've seen our, um, our counselling services under residential schools I would say, grow dramatically over the last two years. Jock says that timing coincides with the discovery of suspected unmarked graves. Robertson says she was notified by Metro Vancouver Indigenous Counseling that non-status Indigenous peoples, including Métis citizens, Inuit, as well as individuals from self-governed nations, will no longer have access to some programs. And Robinson says, as a Nishka woman, she is part of a self-governed nation, but has status. There's no clarification in there for people that are status and uh, from a self-governed nation. Nowhere in there. Again, I fall through the cracks of that identity crisis that I worked so hard to rebuild in counseling. And this one email crumbles all of that to pieces. Some care providers say they were shocked by these changes. We don't have enough time to transition people even to stop seeing us. So what we're seeing is a lot of counselors going, how do I do this for free? How do I just continue giving the service to this individual who is at a high risk of suicide um, instead of giving them the suicide hotline as their only option or telling them, you know what, just walk into the ER if, if you're feeling a certain way because there's actually nowhere else for me to send you. For someone without status, providing that proof could be a challenge. Indigenous Services Canada says it can take between six months to two years to be registered. The FNHA says it's still too early to know exactly how many people will be affected by these changes. And I would say more reality is uh, in the neighbourhood of 1,000 uh, in total uh, to 1,500. Um, but again, that's subject to us actually uh, implementing the verification process. On Monday, Premier David Eby said his government would work to get more supports for residential school survivors. And we'll look at what we can do to backfill as much as possible to provide that support that we know they need to deal with that trauma. The changes to the mental health programs take effect Monday, but for those who can't access FNHA-funded services, it says there are other resources available, including healing lodges, friendship centres and other culturally appropriate supports. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. Seniors who are part of some BC's rent supplement programs will now get a one-time benefit of $430. Not only are we expanding housing opportunities for seniors, building affordable housing options for seniors, but also today helping seniors directly with costs to cover their uh, rents. 
Seniors will receive that top up this month. The province is also expanding eligibility for the shelter aid for elderly rentals and rental assistance programs to allow almost 5,000 more people to qualify. And the monthly subsidy for existing recipients will rise by more than $100. Opposition parties continue to grill the provincial government about its clean energy grant process. Let's be clear. Every step of the way, this government's mantra is, what can we get away with? Every motivation of this government is to deflect, distract, and engage in full-on damage control. We know that grant programs have to be fair to all applicants, and the public needs to know. They need to have confidence that these programs are being managed in the people's interest. The government has ordered the Auditor General to look into MNP, a private accounting firm it hired to administer the clean technology grants on its behalf. This comes after allegations of a conflict of interest, with MNP accused of acting as both grant writer and administrator. It denies those allegations. Last week, the government twice declined to look into the company despite calls from BC United and the BC Conservatives. After five years of resistance, the city of Surrey has now voted to allow cannabis stores to operate there. Twelve storefronts will soon be able to do business. But as Michelle Gassoub explains, the change happened quietly. Five years after cannabis was legalized in the rest of Canada, the city of Surrey voted to allow cannabis retail shops in the city. The motion came and went with little fanfare. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Six different neighborhoods in the city will each be allowed two stores. That's 12 stores in total, compared to over 80 that operate in Vancouver. Council says more could be allowed in the coming years. We are conscious about not flooding uh, the market too quickly. Um, there seems to be some different signals about you know, what is the, you know, the depth of the market. But those familiar with the retail market anticipate if you build it, they will come. Joy, I think is the best uh, way to put it. I think that there has been a lot of anticipation. Uh, Surrey is the second largest municipality in Metro Vancouver area. So, you know, the uh, knockdown effect of them allowing for legal retail, I think is going to be pretty significant. For years, the issue wasn't even up for discussion in the city. Former Mayor Doug McCallum was firmly opposed to retailers setting up shop in Surrey, saying crime was out of control. That decision made the city an outlier. A 2021 study from the province found that consumers in the Fraser South Health Service delivery area, that includes Surrey, were less likely to buy cannabis from legal sources compared to other regions of BC. It's really important for us um, to close access deserts. Uh, it's one of the most important tools that we have to you know, encourage the public to use the legal cannabis system and to kind of leave behind illicit methods of um, acquiring cannabis. The storefronts must be 200 meters from schools, recreation centers and from each other. With Surrey allowing cannabis stores to open within municipal boundaries, Richmond is now one of the only places in BC where you can't buy cannabis at an authorized store. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Heads up, swimmers, the Vancouver Park Board says Kitsilano Pool will reopen for this summer season after all. The pool is set to be open from the May long weekend until Labor Day. Last December, the board said it found two broken pipes were letting 30,000 litres of water to leak out every hour. That is still not fixed, but the Vancouver Park Board plans to do more repair work in the fall. BC's latest snowpack data shows we will need many more April showers. As of April 1st, the provincial snowpack average is 67% of the median, down from 73% on March 15th. The record low pack during the colder months hint at another year of record drought this summer. To help save water, businesses and people in Metro Vancouver will only be allowed to water their lawns now once a week starting May 1st. Darius will have more in his BC-wide weather forecast later in the show. Former Speaker of the House and longtime BC MP John Fraser has died. Fraser was elected as a member of parliament for Vancouver South in 1972 and became environment minister during the Cho Clark government. He returned to cabinet as fisheries and oceans minister after Brian Mulroney's landslide victory in 84, but he stepped down amid a scandal over tuna. In 1986, he became speaker and the first to be elected by secret ballot, serving until he retired in 1993. 
John Fraser died over the weekend. He was 93. Kelowna saw some of last year's worst wildfires. After the break, we'll touch base with a fire chief there trying to prevent disaster this time. And thanks for joining our commercial free live stream tonight. You may not know this, but when you get married, your certificate marks the place you wed. No surprise, the village of love in Saskatchewan gets many requests to host nuptials. And now they have the perfect spot thanks to some hard work repurposing an old bunkhouse. Have a look. Hello, everybody. My name is Shelley Valier, and I am the mayor from the village of love. We're here today at our brand new wedding chapel that used to be the old bunkhouse in Choiceland. So come on off, let's go take a look. The bunkhouse was donated from a gentleman named Jim Blair. And we took that building and in two years, totally gutted it inside and out. And this is what we have. The reason we decided to build the wedding chapel was because our name alone attracted numerous requests for marriage ceremonies. With our existing community hall and park campground, the addition of a wedding chapel completes our offerings for couples to have their dream weddings here. Eventually, we do hope to have a honeymoon cabin for our bride and groom and to put an addition on the chapel for a changing room washroom for the bride and her attendants. It's just been real nice for us to be part of it, you know, to, to build a piece of lasting history that'll be there for many, many years to come when we're gone and somebody else hopefully to carry it on. Kind of how love has always been built. Well, Chapel's just a really good addition to represent our village. The chapel has already seen one wedding in August and we hope to see many more. This week, we're taking a look at how different parts of our province are preparing for the wildfire season. Last year, blazes in Kelowna forced people from their homes, destroyed plant and animal life, and left local fire departments exhausted. Dennis Craig is the Assistant Chief of Wildfire Mitigation and Prevention for the Kelowna Fire Department. Chief, thanks for joining us. First of all, how is the city preparing for this wildfire season? Well, this year we're really focusing on uh, directing a lot of our mitigation efforts and fire smart activities towards uh, private properties and homeowners. Um, we've, that's what we've dedicated everything towards. We're, we're putting a bit of a pause on our mitigation efforts on public lands just to really focus our funding and, and efforts then onto the private properties. And, and when you speak with people in and around Kelowna, how concerned are they and what reaction do they have when, when, when you're there telling them about what they can do to, to prevent fires? 
Well, we're, we're overwhelmed with uh, requests from the public. Um, you know, the interest in the FireSmart program has never been greater. Um, obviously, rightfully so from last year's season that we've had. Um, many residents are very nervous. Um, so really trying to get that message out. We're delivering a hard message this year. You know, we, we got to change behaviors. And that's the message that we're getting out is it's, it's time to really look at your own properties and, and start changing your know, behaviors and, and expectations. When you say you're overwhelmed by the demand for, for FireSmart, what are we talking about? How does it compare to years past? Um, just, you know, tenfold the number of requests. Um, you know, it, you know, people that weren't thinking about it before are thinking about it now. You know, last summer we had embers landing in downtown Kelowna. Everybody viewed fire smart and wildfire as more of a intermix or interface sort of a scenario, um, where if you lived in a downtown urban area, you didn't really think of it as hard or as much. And, you know, seeing embers drop right into our downtown core has now a lot of people more aware and, and thinking about it. Based on what you've seen from the preparation already going on with people wanting to get involved in Fire Smart, how much time do you have and do they have in order to be ready before the serious heat and the serious dangers of wildfires begin again? Well, you know, Fire Smart is not something you're going to, you know, complete in an afternoon or a weekend. It's it's several it's many little things that you can do over time. Um, so it's it's really not about time and how quickly you can do it. It's you've got to start now and and pick the highest priority items um, and work just keep working at it. And it's going to be continuous. It's yard maintenance uh, ongoing. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of things that people ought to be doing now? Well, fire smart is a roof down walls out approach. So, you know, rather than looking at your neighbor's yard or looking at the, the park behind your, your house or across the street, you have to start looking at your own uh, house and structure as the beginning. So, you know, looking at what's gonna ignite your home that's touching your home. Direct flame contact is what burns down homes. Mm -hmm. So obviously those, you know, uh, 20 foot tall cedars that are right touching your house or that cedar hedge that's right into your softening. You know, that's, that's step number one. We, we got to get rid of that combustible material that's touching your house. And lastly, Chief, we appreciate your time. What's, what do you make of the, of the BC government's investment in mitigation as you're doing versus the idea around suppression of fires? Um, you know, Chief Berland uh, said it best last year. Um, you know, we are spending a lot on suppression, and rightly we have to, but we need to start looking and investing more in mitigation um, because, as you see this year with City of Kelowna, you know, we're grant we're using our grant funds, and we have to make a choice: are we going to do mitigation, or are we going to, you know, focus on fire smart activities? Unfortunately, we're not able to do to do both at the same time, just given the the limited funds. Mm -hmm. Dennis Craig, the Kelowna Fire Assistant Chief for Wildfire Mitigation and Prevention. Thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. There's a live shot of a glowing Canby Street Bridge and City Hall in the background. A clear sunny day on the south coast, but Darius Madavi will explain why clouds are on the way in your BC-wide forecast next. My name is Jim Hadfield and I operate Jim's Bread, Buns and Cakes out of Milestone, Saskatchewan. I started out in the finance field, I was an accountant and then I moved into management and uh, retired in 2007. I discovered baking in my retirement when I couldn't find a decent loaf of bread. So I decided I was going to teach myself how to bake, and I did. I took some uh, cinnamon buns to an event in Milestone, and a lady from Regina said to me, you need to go into business. I laughed, but three months later, I decided to start the business, and it was slow at start, but my cousin developed me a website. Again, business was modest. Then I went on Facebook with a Facebook page and things took off. They love the baking, they love the fact that it's homemade. And my baking is oversized. Our breads are big, uh, my buns are a little bit bigger than normal. My cinnamon buns are uh, four inches square and um, quite thick. I didn't intend to have another business, but then um, I thought I would do it for a couple of years 
bake, but it developed into something quite, quite large. I still enjoy baking, even at 72, and it provides me with a wee bit of extra income, not a lot, and it also keeps me busy. It is important, I think, for somebody my age to remain active and focused on something, and uh, so this helps with that. We're sharing really important information with the public, and I feel like this is exactly what our job is, especially as the public broadcaster, especially in morning radio. That's incredibly important. The weather update is brought to you by Direct by Furnace. To cool and clean the air in your home, call Direct by Furnace. Installing Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. Freshly back from watching God Steal the Sun in the eastern part of this continent, Darius Madavi is here to tell us about our BC weather forecast. Good to have you back. You enjoyed it? Oh, so much. I mean, I've seen partial eclipses before, mm -hmm. but it's like a totally different event to see totality. As soon as the sun is completely covered, you can't see anything through your glasses anymore. You take them off, and I was, like, my mind was blown, genuinely. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. Uh, so, Dan, boys trip, 2044. Go up to the piece. <laughs> In the calendar. Go up to the piece. There we yeah, go. there we go. Okay. Uh, alternatively, uh, Spain, northern Spain, 2026. Mm -hmm. Oh, And, okay. you know, Spain in August, even without an eclipse. Oh, it's I delightful. Mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, right? Uh, a little bit hot, but, you know, it's all right. Uh, now, let's take a look at the weather. A little bit less exciting, but, uh, you know, what can you do? There is some excitement on the way as we see this frontal system roll in. We're going to see that hit the northern parts of the island tomorrow, uh, around noon probably, <clears throat> and then continue working its way down at the coast in the early afternoon. So the west coast of the island getting a bit. Maybe some places like Campbell River getting some showers tomorrow, but I think it will be mostly dry, despite what this model is showing here. Then some of that breaking into uh, parts of the, the inner coast as well. And then we're going to continue to see that roll down to Vancouver probably tomorrow late morning maybe early afternoon and then continue to spread <clears throat> into parts of the interior as well so a bit of excitement on the way but overall not too uh, not too long lasting that's going to clear out overnight Thursday into Friday for what will be another mostly sunny day with that cloud probably clearing out late morning on Friday so still a little bit of excitement on the way uh, but overall pretty calm week ahead if we take a look at our temperatures those are going to stay relatively high tomorrow maybe even come up a little bit in parts of the valley here on the lower mainland and in many parts of the interior before dropping decently tomorrow pretty much all across the coast but then coming up again on Friday as we head into what will be a, a decently warm weekend and then if we take a look at our conditions for tomorrow, we do see that activity up and down at the coast. We do see a little bit of cloud moving in at two parts of the southeast, especially around Golden. Uh, but after those, uh, that risk of a thunderstorm that we had tonight, not too much more excitement on at the way tomorrow, generally clearing up in the interior. Uh, for tomorrow night, though, again, you see that activity continuing to move into parts of the coast. And then, of course, for our forecast here in uh, Metro Vancouver, we do have a little bit of excitement on the Thursday as those temperatures mm -hmm. drop. But overall, Pretty sunny and uh, calm week ahead, Dan. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks very much, Darius. Good to have you back. Thank you. And that is your late news for Tuesday. Thank you for joining us tonight. For news anytime, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That starts tomorrow morning at 530.
Good night.